we developed uh, what is the world's largest open laboratory for Fischer trope synthesis. Fischer tropes is a process that was started in Germany in about 1925. Uh, two individuals, Fischer and Tropes, uh, found that they could pass carbon monoxide and hydrogen, the synthesis gas, over a catalyst, in that case cobalt, and convert it to something that resembled transportation fuel. Uh, we've been doing Fisher tropes research for about 15 years. In the last five years, interest in general has picked up. Interest by the U.S. federal government has declined because they are not doing research on transportation fuel now. But interest by companies has picked up. Now you only get 85 to 90 percent of the energy in the ground as petroleum into your car. If we switch to coal, the situation backs off even further so that only about 75 percent of the energy in coal goes into your car. And so at this point, oil companies find it still more efficient to go someplace and find oil, transport it to the U.S., and convert it to gasoline. But oil efficiency is going down, and Fisher Tropes efficiency is going up slowly, so that it's a matter of time, as I see it, until the two become equal or in favor of Fisher Tropes. North America is one of the largest re coal reserve regions. Its petroleum is declining, but the coal is still the largest resource uh, so that if the U.S. is to become independent of foreign source of petroleum, it has to make it either from oil shale or coal or both. You can look at one ton of coal as being equal to two barrels of transportation fuel. We use 20 million barrels a day in the U.S. So we're looking at 10 million barrel equivalent of coal. the processes that, that are run commercially, they tend to favor the production of chemicals over fuel from this process. The reason being the chemicals are worth more on the market than fuel is. Fuel is actually a very low value product. Um, yes, it costs a lot when we're buying it to put in our car, but in comparison to industrial chemicals and feedstocks, it's actually low value. One of the most common ways that the process can be, would be run is to produce actually paraffin wax. Um, the reason for that is you can produce wax and it can be stored indefinitely and it can either be then fed into a refinery and turned into fuel and everything else like we do now with petroleum or the wax itself can be used. Sasol produces wax that is um, food grade. It's actually approved by the FDA and is used to coat fruit that we all buy in the supermarket, apples and pears and things like that. It's used in lip, lip balm. Um, things like that. So there, there are a range of chemicals that can be do, produced that way that are very high value. And the example there is the waxes. We actually use quite a bit of the petroleum that we import, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent for the production of chemicals. And that includes things like the, the feedstocks for making polymers and plastics. And so one of the easiest ways to offset petroleum imports is to produce that portion from indigenous resources rather than import it. It is proving itself as a commercially viable product. It's actually viewed as a high value product. The diesel fuel that's produced by this process is cleaner than what's our current standard for ultra clean or ultra low sulfur diesel. Um, when it's burned, it has fewer particulate emissions than petroleum diesel uh, and lower in the other regulated emissions such as carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen oxides, and sulfur. It's also a premium jet 
product. The, one of the products that can be used from the process is naphtha, which is used in jet fuel. And this is used commercially flying in and out of South Africa as well. There are a couple of environmental impacts that have to be considered in looking at this sort of process. And so in order to get from the solid coal to the liquid fuel, you have to produce CO2. Now with this process, because of the way it works, you have to remove that CO2 from the gas stream anyways. So the process is inherently carbon capture ready and that it can, you, you have to pull the CO2 out and concentrate it already. However, it still needs to be compressed before it could be put into a pipeline or be sequestered. And so most of the issues with the environmental concerns are in what is going to be done with that. We don't want to start producing a fuel that then, you know, that causes more problems than what we have now. When you get to actually using the product, if you're making diesel fuel with this, the actual burning of it will have lower emissions than the petroleum diesel we burn now. When you hear people citing now that this fuel would produce twice the CO2 of what we do now, what they're referring to is the CO2 that's used in the water gas shift reaction during the actual production of the fuel, not in the use of the fuel after it's made. To some extent, you can reduce the amount of CO2 in, in terms of un, unwanted reactions within the process. But in, to get from coal, which is hydrogen deficient, to diesel, which is hydrogen rich, you will produce CO2 in this process, unless you have a free supply of hydrogen. Where some of the debate comes in is in order to then get that to be, uh, by some definitions of carbon capture ready, to go on from there, you then have to pressurize that CO2. And that then would make it available either for sequestration or for use for industrial purposes or the, probably the most likely one for the first several plants that would be built is it would be used for enhanced oil recovery where you inject it into the ground to, to enhance the, the, the production of gas and oil wells. Then the, the, the stuff that's easy to get out of the ground has been taken. Um, estimates range everywhere from 60 to 90 percent of the oil is actually still in the ground however. And some, some of the best fields have a lot of captured, you know, held oil. And CO2, if it's injected properly, preferentially releases the oil. It binds more strongly to the, to the strata than the oil does. And so you can, you can produce about two barrels of oil per ton of CO2 you inject. And then the idea would be that as you'd inject this, you would, you'd pump the field, um, some CO2 would come back out, you would capture it and re-inject. And when you're all done, you'd cap the field, and the CO2 would stay there sequestered geologically. Well, Kentucky is the third largest coal producer in the U.S., and presumably it would strive to keep its position. So you would more than double coal production if you were to replace all petroleum by liquids derived from coal. Our lab is the largest open facility. Uh, we have tested for companies on three continents. Our lab is in a unique situation that we're somewhere between a typical university lab and a typical industry lab. We have the ability to publish in the open literature much of the work we do. At the same time, we interact with a lot of companies so that the research we do is practical and is beneficial to companies. If a company was interested in, located in Kentucky, they would already have an excellent research facility to utilize. We bring about a million and a half dollars a year into the state just to do research so that the Fisher Tropes research is not costing the state, it's actually adding a little bit to the research effort within the state.
control panel for reactors.